Hello, and welcome to the video lecture for Chapter 21 from OpenStax Astronomy. Here we're going to talk about the birth of stars, uh, specifically the, the planetary disk, and the discovery of planets outside of the solar system. So how the formation of stars can lead to planets in a general sense, and how we should expect a lot of planets and have found a lot of planets. So there's kind of just a couple, really just kind of two main ideas in this chapter, and that's kind of understanding how stars form and form disks, and then the types of planets and how we detect them, okay? Um, and furthermore, as we go through this lecture, you, I'm not gonna talk about any equations. The book is pretty light on equations for this chapter. The only equations would be those relevant for the detection of planets around other stars. The only equations that you need to know are the ones that I outline in the homework. So I actually give you the equations in the homework and that's where you're gonna find them. So let's get to the ideas, let's get to the content, okay? So where are stars born? Well, they're born inside of nebula, okay? They're born inside of clouds. What type of clouds? Because we talked about a few types of clouds in the previous lecture. They're, they're born inside of molecular clouds. Okay, so that's gonna be a key idea that you're gonna see here, is it's not, it isn't H2 clouds, it's not atomic hydrogen clouds that they're born in, it's molecular clouds. These are the clouds with the largest types of particles because they're going to have dust in them. They're also going to have molecules, so they're not just formed of atoms. And these are much cooler clouds, all right, because they've had an opportunity to leak away some of their heat through radiation, all right? Um, here's an example of one of those types of molecular clouds where stars are born, the Carina Nebula, okay? And so it's going to be regions of dust and molecules. Why dust? because the dust protects the molecules. And this is, a, this is a throwback to ideas that we saw in the previous chapter. All right, so the existence of rather large complex molecules in space and their ability to not be torn apart by ambient infrared radiation is because there is also dust, interstellar dust, that absorbs that, that radiation and protects the molecules. And over, and over time, that type of interstellar cloud is the type that can form a star, all right? And here we see that there's a huge amount of infrared radiation that is being um, emitted by hot stars, okay? These are hot stars in the Orion Nebula. And as we look at the large amount of heat that these bright, large stars are outputting, this is relevant because well, first of all, this would not be a good place for star birth in this immediate region of high infrared radiation, all right? If anything, this would, this would lead to an H2 cloud. I, in other words, ionized hydrogen, H2. Kind of hard to see there, but H2. But here's the thing, is it is pushing gas. And so to have hot stars nearby has the effect of pushing gas into regions that are denser, Eventually those denser regions can lead to the amalgamation of particles into dust. Eventually that dust can, can protect and promote the existence of future molecules and then allow for a region of denser, cooler gas to form. It's very much a chain reaction to allow for the types of conditions that eventually are dense enough for the clouds to be able to collapse into stars because ultimately we need the dense, cool molecular clouds to collapse into stars. Dense, cool molecular clouds, nebula, collapse into stars. All right, the hot, low density ionized clouds do not collapse into stars, okay? but they might promote the existence, okay, through pushing of energy, all right? This is furthering on that idea of looking at the infrared spectrum and seeing that flow of heat through the interstellar medium, okay? Here we have a region that is harboring young stars. Notice the two images. In image A, we're looking at a few visible stars, all right? And in image B, we're looking in the infrared. Where do you see more stars? In the visible spectrum, you know, the colors of the rainbow, 
or in the infrared with false coloring of blues and reds, but ultimately all outside of human vision. So all at that longer wavelength, lower energy light. Where do you see more stars? Visible or infrared? Infrared, of course, because these are stars that would otherwise be obscured by the clouds that allowed them to be created in the first place. What type of clouds? Molecular clouds. Okay. Here we have another young star cluster. All right. Westerloon 2. Okay. So this is talking about how the existence of star clusters will beget more star clusters. So there's a process, there's a chain reaction here. The more star clusters there are, the more star clusters that can be born. How so? Well, here's an example of an old star cluster that has started to spread out due to the individual movement of stars. Okay, here's a younger star cluster that happens to be 100 light years away. And here's an even younger star cluster where the stars are not as large, not as bright, because stars can get larger and brighter as they die. Okay, more on that in future chapters. But here's a young group of smaller stars. Notice its proximity to a molecular cloud. That proximity creates a region of compressed gas that creates the conditions for gravitational collapse to form another cluster of soon-to-be stars called protostars. So protostars become stars. So here we see star clusters... Each of these are each of the circled groups here are star clusters forming more star clusters. So we can have a chain reaction of star clusters. So we can imagine that maybe hundreds of millions of years ago, this molecular cloud was larger and it's been compressed one star cluster group after another, kind of collapsing, collapsing like a domino effect into more stars. Okay? So protostars become stars. All right. Here is the formation of the disk around the star. First, we start with a large molecular cloud. That molecular cloud will collapse. As it collapses, it will also rotate to conserve angular momentum. And as it does that, it will create stellar wind which is charged particles, think electrons, that race away from the poles of the spinning protostar, the spinning protostar, okay? And so that's, that's a key characteristic that we see for the birth of stars, for the formation of protostars, are plumes of charged particles that we call stellar wind, that come from the poles of that protostar, okay? Also, also notice that we have the formation of the disk, okay? The disk that will become, that will add matter to the protostar, eventually adding enough matter to start fusion, at which point the star goes onto the main sequence and becomes a star. I'll remind you of that in just a minute in a future slide. But also the remnants of which will become the planets, the asteroids, and the comets, and the dwarf planets of that solar system. So the leftover matter in this disk will become that system of planets, okay, orbiting around that star. And because most stars form from disks, most stars have planets, okay? The jets, the plumes of stellar wind charged particles that race away from the poles of forming stars, birthing stars, also known as protostars, are called herbig haro objects. Okay, there. herbig haro, herbig haro, so HH objects. So they're all named HH and the number to denote which one astronomer is referring to. The velocity of the electrons is as fast as 580,000 kilometers per hour. So very, very fast. All right, very fast electrons, which um, emit some, you know, some high energy, high energy light, and themselves are very high energy particles. Here are more examples of HH Herbig Haro objects. In other words, stellar wind plumes coming from stars. We can see they clearly look like plumes. In this case, coming from two stars, the star itself obscured because it is behind or within 
a molecular cloud that allowed it to be formed in the first place, okay? And the density of that cloud allows for no light and sometimes even no infrared light to pass through, okay? Here are some more examples of, yes, plumes, but also the disks themselves. Notice that we can see in a few cases the clear disk, the protoplanetary disk, as an absence of light. Because it is so dense, it is formed of so many molecules and um, dust particles, interstellar dust particles, that it is blocking all forms of light. But we can see it due to the fact that there's no light there and it's clearly cutting off the otherwise bright light from the stellar wind, okay? Because the charged particles passing through whatever other amount of interstellar medium, whether that's molecular, molecular or atomic, is, uh, is, is creating light due to the, the energy interactions. But the disk itself being so much denser, you know, light is obviously being created inside of it, but it's trapped inside. The heat and energy, the light is trapped inside of the disk. It's bouncing around, essentially, all right? So this is very, very neat evidence so that we can really see that stars form with protoplanetary disks, all right? All right, and these are taken with the Hubble telescope, okay? And a particular um, constellation, Taurus, at a distance of about 450 light years from Earth, okay? Very neat stuff. Now here is the slide that I mentioned a moment ago about when does a protostar become a star, all right? Well, it depends on the mass of the molecular cloud that formed it, and thus the initial size of the star. So we can have very huge stars, 100, mass, 100 solar mass stars that form out of very large molecular clouds and eventually come in and then get onto the main sequence. Notice in that process, their temperature gradually heated up until it reached a temperature, a surface temperature of almost 60,000 Kelvin for the hottest stars. On the other hand, if we look at the smallest stars, the smallest stars that are actually have enough energy to create fusion, those that are about 10 times smaller than the sun, we can see that when the, when the protostar is formed, it actually doesn't heat up that much. It mostly just increases luminosity as internal processes happen until it eventually joins the main sequence. But regardless of the path taken and whether that path involves a large temperature change on the surface, or mostly just a luminosity change, what's happening in every case, and sometimes there's, there are complicated processes that cause a dip in luminosity, but in every case, what's happening is that the star eventually reaches the main sequence. It goes from being a protostar be to becoming a star at this point, okay? And that's when it has zero age at that moment in time, because that moment in time represents the start of fusion in the core of the star, okay? So protostars get on the main sequence, which is to say they become stars when fusion begins in the core. That is the definition of a star as opposed to any other stellar object. And a star cannot be a star without fusion in the core. We'll talk more about fusion. We'll talk about the types of fusion more, but for now, suffice to say, all stars, regardless of the, the exact type of fusion that's happening, they're all at the ultimate, ultimately they are all fusing hydrogen and the hel helium, but in different ways, a few, diff a few key different ways, but importantly, all hydrogen and helium, or even more importantly, just the fact that uh, atoms are being fused together, okay? Two atoms are becoming one. That's the definition of a star, okay? No ambiguity, that is what a star is. And every star starts on the main sequence. It goes from protostar to main sequence. If you recall the HR diagram before, there was a lot of things that weren't on the main sequence. The giants, the supergiants, the hypergiants, the white dwarfs, those are all dying stars or dead stars. We'll talk more about those later, okay? They're still stars because they still have fusion, but, but they've left the main sequence. But they all started there. Every star starts on the main sequence. If you look here, there um, also are a lot of values that are um, orders of magnitude of 10. These refer, these refer to the time it takes for the stars to reach that level, okay? So this is the, the time, in, so very, you know, a very, very long time in some cases and much less time in other cases in terms of how, how long it takes for 
very, you know, very large stars. We have um, in measured in, let's check the units here. I believe it should be years, number of years. So Earth years. So very large stars only take 10 to the 4, which would be 10,000 years to form from the very beginnings of being a protostar. Whereas the smallest stars that barely have enough mass to become stars at all, that barely have enough mass to have fusion at all, take 10 to the 8, which is 100 million years. So much, much longer to get started. Okay? Okay. Here are more examples of disks. In this case, we're looking head on on disks. I think these pictures are quite dramatic because you can see due to the high density of the protoplanetary disk, the disks around protostars, those are, those are interchangeable terms, by the way, protoplanetary disk, disk around protostar, same idea, but those disks are quite dense and they're obscuring all the light that would otherwise be coming from them or passing through them. All right, here are more examples of protoplanetary disks, very, very high, high resolution, lots of detail. It, um, the the uh, description on this figure talks about the mechanism that was used to take such an image. And then these are artist renditions with a computer of what the disk may look like if we were to see it up close, All right? Here's a disk around a young star. This is a famous picture of a protoplanetary disk because we can see the rings forming that likely will become planets. To our best understanding of the models that we have of how planets form, it's these rings, okay? They will eventually um, come together as planets through the process of, I mentioned this before, accretion, okay? So the process of accretion will lead to these rings in the protoplanetary disk, which is many, maybe, you know, 20 astronomical or 50 astronomical units across, that these rings will become planets. And do we know the exact mechanisms? No, but we know that there's lots of planets out there around other stars. And we know there's lots of disks, and we clearly see that the disks must become planets, okay? All right, so let's talk about how we actually find those planets because I just said I said that there's supposedly lots of planets around other stars. Well, planets are pretty small and much, much, much less bright than stars. So how do scientists actually know that there are lots of planets around other stars? Well, let's give a rundown of the tools that astronomers use to measure the existence of planets around other stars. One big idea, and perhaps the, the most important one, is the idea of the Doppler method of detecting planets. This has been the, um, the method that's probably led to the most discovery of planets and was one of the first methods devised. The idea is shown here in this figure where you can see that the center of the planet and star is not exactly the center of the star, okay? This is true of our own star. Now it is almost never this dramatic, okay? where the star is you know, rotating almost like a planet. In this case, the star and planet would have to be relatively close in mass, but this is the center of mass of the system. Okay? And the key idea though, is that the center of mass is not at the center of the star. So even if the star doesn't truly orbit, as in this dramatic example, it at least wobbles. And that wobble can be measured due to the red shift when the wobble is moving away from us and the blue shift when the wobble is moving towards us. That motion is quite easy to measure at high resolution, high accuracy, and it tells exa us exactly how fast the star is moving and thus how much mass it would take to cause that wobble, okay? In 1995, Didier Quelles and Michael Mayer of the Geneva Observatory were the first to discover a planet around a regular star they're seen, seen here, okay? So here we have, using that method, the first star discovered, a planet discovered around a regular star, okay? An interesting quant consequence of discovering planets or reaction or kind of, cons you know, this, a, what's the word I'm looking for, excuse me, but just the idea that we've, we've been discovering lots of these planets and we've seen over time that these planets aren't exactly like those in our solar system. We've found something called hot, hot Jupiters. These are Jupiter-type planets that orbit close to sun-like stars. The first planets discovered were hot Jupiters because they were large and close to their stars, thus causing a easy-to-measure wobble. Think how much our star would wobble if Jupiter had an orbit like Mercury. But that begs the question, 
how would Jupiter have an orbit of Mercury if Mercury is inside of the frost line? And, you know, gas giants can't form inside of the frost line because there are no ices to form in the first place. Well, that tells us that hot Jupiters must be a new kind of planet that we don't have. And they're very common, or at least they're common because they're easy to detect. But at the very least, there's a lot of them out there, okay? Whether they're the majority of planets or not. And what these hot Jupiters represent is the idea that there must be planetary migration. That hot Jupiters migrated inward towards the sun over millions of years. Okay? That process probably comes from interaction with the planets and leftover material in the protoplanetary disk, but is something that didn't happen in our particular solar system. Okay? Another method of planet detection is the transit method. Because when a planet passes in front of a star, the amount of light coming from that star, the brightness as measured on Earth, all right, is reduced. It's reduced usually by a fraction of 1%, sometimes a fraction of a tenth of 1% or even less. But there is a noticeable reduction in that light, all right? And also the shape of the curve can help give us some idea about you know, what, how the planet is passing in front of its star, all right? But here's the idea, right? Is that this planet doesn't create its own light, so by passing in front of the star, the total amount of light that's re reaching Earth is reduced. And scientists see lots of examples of these dips in the light curve, all right? The dip in the light curve. This also tells us a bit about the velocity of the planet, doesn't it? Because it, it, we can see for how long the dip takes, okay? So here are examples of Kepler, a famous space-based telescope that is looking at um, exoplanets and taking measures, measurements of them, specifically of the transit of planets by measuring that variation in brightness. Okay? We can also take direct images. These are rare. All right? This is kind of the forefront of detecting planets around other stars, which are often called exoplanets. Okay? But we can find images that actually will show the light reflected off of the planets, this being a dramatic example. To do that, we have to use mechanisms like those used for the protoplanetary disk that we saw before that obscure the light coming from the star. Okay, so this basically a very difficult and sophisticated um, imaging technique. When we collect all of our exoplanets and think about what are their properties, we get a graph like this, which shows the planet radius measured in Earth radii, graphed against the orbital period, measured in days, all right? And we see that planets that have Earth radii that are close to one, because this would be planets the size of Earth, are quite common, all right? However, many of them don't have orbits that are quite as long as ours at 365 days. Many are much closer with, much, with orbits, you know, closer to those of Venus or, Jupiter, or um, Mercury, excuse me, but we do certainly have some in the range of, you know, having periods like Earth. And that may just because some of these planets are orbiting stars that are smaller than ours, half, half the size of our star, for example. Okay. And then we can see that there are other, other types of stars as well. There are, are other types of planets, excuse me, that um, can be my, uh, much larger. So we can have ones that are 20 or 40 times the radius of, of Earth, right? So those that are the size of Jupiter, those are the size of New Neptune and so on. If we look at Jupiter-like planets, all right, well, the orbital period of Jupiter is going to be um, between um, 1,000 and 10,000 days. So it's going, to be, it's going to be in this range right here. And so we can see that there are a lot of Jupiter-sized planets that have orbits that are much, much closer, that orbital periods that are much less than Earth. So these right here, what would those be? Hot Jupiters. Okay. And I know it's kind of a funny term, right? Why do we care about it so much? We care about it again because it's a very unusual type of planet compared to our solar system. It's hard to imagine it existing in our solar system, but they are relatively common, right? We see actually quite a few of them. And it's fascinating because it, we need to explain its mechanism of how such a thing could happen. And also it's just a testament that they're really easy to find because you know that's a, that's a lot of mass relatively close to a star, which would cause a big variation in both 
brightness when the planet passes in front of the star, so they're using the transit method, and a large variation in the center of mass, thus a large wobble using the Doppler method. Okay? Um, this is a bar graph showing the, um, the number of the fraction of planets that fall into certain uh, sizes. And this is um, found among the first 2,213 Kepler planets discovered. And we see that we have a lot of planets that, um, you know, are Earth size. So certainly they're not rare, right? So, you know, there's 381 of those first 2,213 are Earth size. We do have quite a few that are super Earths. So what are super Earths? Well, they're another type of planet that we don't have in our solar system, and maybe even that we don't have at all, because you can say, well, we have Jupiter-sized planets, we just don't have them in Mercury-like orbits, so we don't have hot Jupiters, but we do have Jupiters, but we don't have super-Earths at all anywhere. Super-Earths are terrestrial planets based on the density that astronomers can calculate, but they are quite common. In fact, they're the co most common type of planet um, detected by Kepler, by the Kepler project and the Kepler um, telescope based in space. Yeah, and we don't have them. All right, so they're somewhere between the size of Earth and Neptune. All right, so what, what are they, right? Just a new type of planet. Now, whenever we talk about the, this, this counting mechanism of how many planets we have, this counting method of how many planets have shown up, it is always going to be biased to the methods being used. You know, maybe we're just finding more of these super Earths, not because there are half the planets in the galaxy or something, but just because they're easy to detect, right? So there's, you know, we have to keep that in mind, that we're using you know, these very indirect methods. It's very rare to get a direct image of these planets. And even then, if they, you know, the planet would just be a couple pixels across. And we're, making, we're having to figure out based on models and assumptions and, and you know, uh, indirect methods. And so that is always something to consider. Okay? These planets are out there, but we may find that there was something wrong with our methods. Okay? But there certainly do appear to be a lot of super Earths. So as far, if you're keeping track so far, there's been kind of two categories of planets that are different and interesting that I mentioned, hot Jupiters and super Earths, okay? Here's the size distribution of planets for stars similar to our sun. So when we, so when we look at more specifically and a smaller sample of planets around stars like our sun, well, what do we see? Well, now we see that, again, super Earths are common, but Earths are also very common. All right, and Earths are just about the most common type of planet size out there. All right, so you know, in our, if in our, in our own solar system, that kind of matches up. We have Earth and Venus that are both about the same size. So that would, if you looked at a system like ours, that would add to the total number of planets like that. Um, and then, you know, but then we also have gas giants, right? So does that that so this this graph would suggest that for stars like ours, because that's what we have, right? Stars like the sun, right, that's, that's the data shown here in the graph, that most of those solar systems have Earths, super Earths, and only some of them have gas giants. Well, is that the case? Is our, is our solar system rare because it has gas giants? That could be true. Of course, you know, we don't have a hot Jupiter, and it does seem like, you know, a significant proportion of solar systems have hot Jupiters, so maybe having a lot of gas giants is unusual. It's also possible that we're just not detecting them. Because if you think about the gas giants in our own solar system, in particular the ones that are very far away from the sun, like Uranus and Neptune, those would be extremely difficult planets to detect around another star. They have very long orbits, and their gravitational pull is weakened due to their distance. So think about either the transit method, the Doppler method, direct imaging, anything. It's going to be very difficult to actually find them. So it may be that we're missing the distant gas giants and they're not as rare as a graph like this suggests. All right, so here this is looking at density. So we see um, on the vertical axis, planet radius, and on the horizontal axis, planet mass. All right, so that means that the curves are density because that would be volume over mass, or rather mass over volume, all right? Um, and so. When we look here, these different these these curves do represent density. This is the density of hydrogen, the density of water, the density of rock, and the density of iron. All right. So, in other words, if there's little black dots that fall along the the along of the curve of iron, that's telling us that we're looking at planets that have that are very dense, that are mostly metallic. All right. Well, we have planets like that in our solar system, right? We have the dense um, planets, right, that are somewhere between the densities of rock and iron. 
Well, certainly, right? We have, you know, Venus, we have Mercury, we have Earth, we have Mars, right? So these are dense, these are dense planets, okay? Um, they, you know, they certainly do, we find that they do exist, okay? In this particular um, set of data, there's not many that fall um, up that match up with planets in our solar system. Are there, are the two shown here are kind of by themselves. I'm not sure if these two represent Venus and Earth because obviously not all four of the terrestrial planets are showing, right? There's only one, two, three, four, five, six uh, triangles here, although we have eight planets, okay? So we're left off at least two. Um, maybe they're behind a red dot. But anyway, um, there's, it's, again, there's not, it's, not, it's not as if there's no dots that fall here. This is just one particular subset of data. Um, let's see, the source is not listed, okay? But anyway, what we do find, the interesting thing about this graph is that certainly we do have planets that have densities more like water. That would be like, um, you know, certainly um, uh, Jupiter and, um, and Saturn would have those, those densities, right? We do have densities that are, um, um, that are gonna be closer to, that are um, less dense, you know, such as Saturn, for example, the least dense. But look at this. There are a lot of planets out there that have very, very low density. That is, again, something that we don't see in our solar system. So many low density exoplanets. Okay. And so, again, another interesting thing. It could be, and this is me speculating a bit, but it could be that these match up a lot with the hot Jupiters because if you heat up a gas, it can become less dense. Think about a balloon expanding when it gets hot. So if you have a gas giant like Jupiter that's, that's closer to its sun because it migrated inwards due to interactions with the protoplanetary disk, well, now it's warmed up, it's hotter, and it's less dense. So less dense planets are quite possibly hot Jupiters. Okay? This is showing the idea of something called the habitable zone. The habitable zone is dependent on the star. So not all stars have habitable, habitable zones that are the same distance from them. For our particular star, the Sun, the habitable zone starts at about the orbit of Venus and it ends just past the orbit of Mars. So it's, you know, and we're, here we are at one astronomical unit, all right? That's our distance, Earth's distance, average distance from the Sun. So that's the habitable, habitable zone based on the particular energy output and type of energy output from a star like ours, the Sun. Now, for, diff for smaller red dwarfs, the habitable zone is going to be smaller and tighter in. For larger, hotter stars, the habitable zone is going to be much further out. And, you know, it could be as far as Jupiter's orbit um, compared to our, our solar system or even further. It just depends on the size and the, the energy output of the sun or the star. Okay? But the point being is that we, we have found planets in stars' respective habitable zone. Okay? For example, looking at the Kepler-62 system, we see that there are at least two planets, 62F and 60, um, 62E, that fall well within the habitable zone. Okay, what is it? I made a big deal about where, how we measure it and how it depends on the star. It's simply the zone that could support life. And how do we know that? Because it's the zone that could support liquid water on the surface of the planet. All right. Now, does it mean liquid water on the surface of the planet? No, because Venus and Mars don't have liquid, liquid water on the surfaces, but they could. Venus doesn't because of the runaway greenhouse effect that has led to the incre incre extremely dense and hot atmosphere. And Mars doesn't have one because its lack of a magnetic field means that it cannot hold on to an atmosphere and it's been stripped away and because it's, it's geologically dead. And thus Mars also does not have liquid water because it's too cold. Okay, but Mars used to have liquid water, okay, and Venus probably did too. Okay, so, so the habitable zone isn't a, doesn't mean that life is there for sure, but it certainly makes it more probable. And point being, if you haven't noticed, there are a, a lot of planets out there that are, have good prospects of being Earth-like or livable, okay? There are many. And if you think about that, if you really stop and think about it, that sounds like a sci science fiction type of statement, but it is absolutely true. There are many Earth-like planets that we could live on or that could be supporting life like the life here on Earth right now. But the distances them are still unimaginably large. So we're not going to be visiting them or sending probes there anytime soon because a light year is a long way to travel. But it's a good place to start knowing that such planets exist. Okay, so I hope this lecture talking about the formation of stars from molecular clouds 
the fact that stars always form protoplanetary disks and that those disks then have planets that we can detect and learn interesting things about has been a nice introduction to the life cycle of stars, an idea that we'll continue to talk about in future chapters. Thank you so much for watching this lecture video. I'll talk to you all soon.